Well, we have just about everything on this. I'm sure. I knew this day was going to come. <laughs> As I tried to tell you for two straight years, the, you and I are going to need to <laughs> yeah. We're going to need to review some of this pre-calc. Um, trig, pre-calc, logs, all of that stuff. Now, you want to send me a picture? Would that be easier than verbalizing everything? Um, sure. D okay. Can you see my screen as well? No, or? no, I can't. Oh. I do have the capability of making you the presenter where I would be able to see your screen, but I've experimented quite a bit with it and that doesn't work all that well. It works best if we just leave it on my screen. And if you can send me pictures and send it to this email address, don't send it to my phone. I can't do anything with it. Okay. You would think I could forward it, but my phone does not do that well. When people send pictures, text them to me, I'm not able to look at them in any shape or manner. So send it here and send them just one at a time. Don't send a batch of them because it'll take 10 minutes for all of them to get here. So let's start out with just one picture and make it the one you want to start working on. Okay. And then as we go along today, you can send as many pictures as you know we're going to need to cover an hour today. But initially, just send it. Tell me when your computer says sense. You got that email address? Yes, it should be a C. Yeah, make sure you spell it right so that it'll always be in there. In other words, from now on is all you should have to do is type DA and it'll default to my email. How do I attach an image to this? What? Are you using an iPhone? Yes. <laughs> attach it as a large image, not a small image. And I don't have an iPhone, so I'm not sure I can instruct you on how to do it. Uh, once you figure out how to do it, it'll be automatic. And you need to figure out how to do it because we'll need to do it like this for, you know, as long as we're not in person, this is the best way to do it is for you to send me a picture of the material. Now, if you can't figure out how to attach it, then I would say let's spend today. You can verbalize some problems. And then between today and the next session we have, you can figure out how to send an email as a large file image. I'm sure there's multiple people around there that know how to do it. You could look it up on Google, and they'll tell yep. you how to do it. I just sent you the first one. Yep. All right. Let's have a look at it here. Okay. I got it. Now I should be able to download that. And then I can zoom or rotate or whatever I need to do. Okay. Let me open up zoom here. All right, so I tell you what, go ahead and send me the second picture because it looks like we're going to be able to answer these pretty quickly, I think. Um, and you can send, if, if you have two more pictures you want to send, go ahead and send them in another email. And then while we're working on this picture, you'll be able to, we won't have to wait for the others to get here. So you're taking a heavy course load? Um, I was at first. I've dropped a few classes. Okay. Are you living in the dorms? Yes. Yeah? How do you like that? Um, it's fun. My roommate's pretty good. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's important to have a good roommate. I uh, My first year at Mines, I had a bad roommate, and that wasn't any fun at all. He stole my... 
He dropped out of school and stole my ROTC uniform and turned it in as his. <laughs> really? Yeah. Ooh. I was not good at all. I had to go into the ROTC commandant and tell him what happened, and he didn't charge me for it. So, um, All right. We ready to begin on this? Yeah, I sent you a few more emails. Oh, cool. I'll bring them up as need be. For right now, let's just go through these. Okay. Okay. Uh, I now have the capability of writing on the document, which I have found makes it a lot easier. Okay. In other words, we're okay. doing this problem. So how do I answer that question, what the domain is? Um. What do we know about radical signs? The square root sign. What is that? Oh, it's what it's to the tell us? to the negative one half power, right? Well, yeah, but that's not really what we need at the moment. We need to figure out what are the allowable figures for t. Could t be minus two? Uh, no. Because we'd be taking the square root of a negative number, right? Yeah. So, whenever you have a square root with a complicated expression inside, so all you need to do is take that complicated expression, and we know that it has to be greater than or equal to zero. We cannot take the square root of negative numbers. So whatever's inside that radical sign has to be greater than or equal to zero. Now, solve that inequality, and you'll have your answer. What's the next step? Uh, add 20 to both sides. So t squared greater than or equal to 20. And then and take the square root of both sides. So t yeah, would be the square root of 20. Got to be a little bit careful. Excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. Hold on. Bless you. <laughs> Ooh, geez, a lot. Yeah, it's allergy season here. Well, you probably don't have that problem when you're in Arizona right now, do you? Yeah, I don't know. It's monsoon season right now. so. Well, but I'll bet you the allergies are worse here than there just because the plant cycle is different. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you used to suffer from allergies, at least in the spring. <laughs> okay, so what's T? Uh, square root of 20. All right, let's start by simplifying square root of 20. Now, I'm going to leave what's in between a blank because this is a little tricky. You have to be a little careful when you have an inequality like this. But first of all, simplify the square root of 20. That's not an appropriate answer, and I don't mean use your calculator. I mean leave the answer in radical. So what is the square root of 20? Um, square root of 5 times 2. Good. Okay. So that's our radical sign. Now, we're not quite sure what the inequality direction should be, but clearly if t was greater than that, we'd be in good shape, right? Yeah. And if t is less than then that we're not in good shape. But if t is less than the negative of that, we're in good shape. Hmm. You see why? Let's say yeah. t was 5, that inequality is satisfied. But let's say t is minus 5. Well, that inequality is still satisfied. As long as t, whenever you're doing, and I suppose this, this is going to be greater than or equal, and that's going to be less than or equal. So when you do inequalities and you take the square root of both sides, 
your answer is going to be a plus or minus. And the plus, you're going to be greater than or equal to the plus, and you're going to be less than or equal to the minus in a situation like this. And if you don't know how to solve that, just do a couple cases like I did. In other words, okay. it's it's pretty makes it pretty clear when you actually substitute some real numbers where your answer is going to lie. But the biggest thing is when you take the square roots of both sides of an inequality, you have to be careful. Your answer is going to have a plus and a minus, and usually the plus it's greater than, and the minus it's less than. You see why this one works? Yeah. Yeah, if t was, yeah. say t was minus 10, well, that's less than this. Well, minus 10 squared is plus 100. So anything less than this number satisfies that inequality, and anything greater than this number satisfies that inequality. So now let's talk about our domain. Let's put a number. First of all, tell me how they want you to express domain. Do they want you to use interval notation? Do they want you to just say this? In other words, that's, that's the domain also. T has to be greater than that or less than or equal to this. I could also put it on a number line where I have minus 2 root 5 there, and I have plus 2 root 5 here, and there's 0, and that is my solution. So there's a number of ways to express domain. Are you familiar with interval notation? Yeah, I think he wants us to do like a, um, what is it? It's like t is less than or equal to negative 2 uh, to the square, uh, times the square root of 5, um, but, or, and then greater than or equal to 2 square root of 5. So this on the lower right would satisfy him? Um, but he wants just like one t, and it's all written on like one line. Okay, you can't do that. What you can do is interval notation. Let me show you what interval notation is. If you start from the left, negative infinity, and here's our allowable domain. Now use a bracket there because it can be that. There's nothing wrong with taking the square root of zero. But then it's in union with, and it can also be 2 root 5 up to infinity. Infinities always have parentheses. So this is called interval notation, and it's all on one line. But because the solution here is not, in other words, if the solution was between 2 root 5 and 2 root 5, then I could have written it the way you're talking about. In other words, I could do something like this. t has to be greater than or equal minus 2 root 5 and less than or equal to 2 root 5. But notice that would be that solution, and that isn't our solution. If that was our solution, I could write it in one line like this. But it isn't. We're to the left of this point, and we're to the right of this point. So we have two different intervals. And that's why they came up with this thing called interval notation, is because this allows me to perfectly spell out exactly what intervals are in this domain. Anything between those two numbers is in it, and anything between those two numbers is in it. Yeah, he uses that, the interval notation. Okay, good. Now we know what to use for the rest of it. So what, like, if, when would you use in union as opposed to something else? Oh, well, if you have multiple intervals, you're always going to have a union sign. You could have three intervals. You could have four intervals. There can be an unlimited number of intervals, but you just use this U sign. 
The key is whether you use parentheses or brackets. You understand when to use brackets? Yeah, brackets when it's equal to, or it could be equal to. Yeah, if it was just this, in other words, if it was just T had to be greater than that, then I would use parentheses on both of them. But since T can be greater than or equal to that, it's a bracket. And you always use parentheses next to infinity signs. Always. All right, let's go to the next one. Now, this one right here. What's the only possible pro Well, first of all, can you take cube roots of negative numbers? No. Yes, you can. You can? Yeah. The cube root of negative 8 is negative 2. What's the cube root of positive 8? 2. Those are your two answers right there. There's no plus or minus when you're dealing with cube roots. Notice why that first one is true. Because minus 2 times minus 2 times minus 2 is minus 8. It's all it has to be true. So, first of all, you can take cube roots of positive and negative numbers. And that's important to realize off the get-go. All right. So, what is the only restriction here? In other words, we're not restricted as to what can go under the radical sign. But there is one main rule of mathematics that you always have to remember, which is? Um, can't divide by what? Zero. Yeah, that's first law. If you were to go onto Google and say, give me the Ten Commandments of Mathematics, they might give you 10 different lists that all have different properties in them. Number one on everybody's list is going to be thou shalt not divide by zero. So there is one value for y that we cannot allow. What is it? Zero. Or no, uh, two. Y cannot be equal to two. Now, there's various ways to write this. You could say uh, there's this notation where y can be all reals except 2. Okay? But that's not interval notation. So let's use let's be consistent and use interval notation for all of these. So what interval can y be? Um, all real numbers, so it'd be step two. So start with negative infinity and work left to right. Negative infinity uh, to two. Bracket or parentheses? Uh, parentheses. In union with? Um, two, well, or parentheses two, and then uh, positive infinity. That's how you say everything but two. Okay? Okay. All right. Let me erase this. Don't you think this system works a little better where I can write on the document? I love it. Yeah, um, it's good. Yeah, it's cool. I didn't realize I could take a screenshot of whatever I have on my screen and then write on it with my, you know, stylist and drawing tablet. Okay, if we look at that, do you see any x values that are going to give us problems? Um, zero. Or no. Hmm. No, there aren't any. So the domain of this is minus infinity to plus infinity. 
Where you find restrictions is when you have a square root sign or dividing by something because you can never take the square root of negative numbers and you can never divide by zero. So this problem has neither of those. You don't need to worry about it. It's just a straight polynomial, okay? And with most straight polynomials, it's all real numbers. X, X can be all reals or in an interval notation like that. All right. Next problem. Any restrictions on Z? Negative four. Anything else? Um, I think that's it. Okay, give it to me in interval notation. Negative infinity, comma, four, or negative four. Negative four, okay. And then unit in union, uh, parenthesis, negative four, comma, positive infinity. Yeah, the only number that we don't want is negative four. Domain is always that. When you're trying to figure out domain, you want to be in the mindset of uh, what numbers don't work. Because so many functions, you can take... Like a polynomial, you can use any value for x there you want. You can use negative, zero, positive, a billion, a minus a billion. So it's only when you have these special restrictions that you have to pay attention. Okay? Now, the last one here. There's a vacuum outside. I might need to put in my headphones soon. <laughs> Okay. If it's bothering you, it's not bothering me. I I don't uh, hear it hardly. So. Okay. Let's look at this function right here. On the right. What's the domain of that function? Um. What values can x take on? E. Well, no. Again, you got to start thinking about what values can it not be. It doesn't do really any good to figure out what it can be because there's an infinite number of numbers that it can be. Is there anything it can't be? Can you take uh, zero? Okay. So you can't take the log of zero. That's correct. Can you take the log of negative numbers? No. Okay. So what's that leave? All positive numbers. Give me the interval notation. It'd be um, zero comma plus infinity. Perfect. Both around parentheses because it cannot be zero. Okay. This function is actually more restrictive than this function. In other words, the square root function is all I need is for x to be greater than or equal to zero. But the log function, x cannot even be zero. It has to be a number greater than zero. So now let's go back and look at this function that is the act actual problem. So, uh, in, in other words, E is a number. That's not a variable? Yeah, it's a number. Number 2.712884 or something like that. It's an irrational number. But the one thing we know, okay, so is the domain for that function the same as the domain for the function I just wrote. Uh, 
Uh, I don't know. It is. In other words, I can take the number e to both positive and negative exponents. There's nothing that prevents me from taking e to the minus 100 power. And there's nothing that prevents me from taking e to the positive 100 power. And in fact, I can take e to the zeroth power. So really our restrictions is entirely based on that. And that is the same as that. So what's the restriction again? What does T have to be? This time I'm going to write it a little more simple. I'm not going to write it in interval notation yet. So T has T. to be what? All positive numbers. Put it like that. That says the same thing, only numerically, not with words. T has to be greater than zero. Now, if I want to write that in interval notation, it's that. Okay? But a lot of times, that's the easier way to think about it. Just T has to be positive. All right. Use the line AX plus BY equals C, where A, B, and C are constants to answer the questions. Find the equation of the line that is parallel to the given line and passing through the origin. Okay. What does parallel mean? What main thing does that mean? If I have two lines, um, if I have two lines same parallel, what do they have? Same slope. Ah, key. That's the key. So tell me what the slope of that line is. That's a line. It's just got an X term and a Y term. It's not in your familiar Y equal MX plus B format. So let's put it into that format. Solve this equation and put it into y equal mx plus b format. So it would be negative a uh, x plus c over b. Good. So or if I want to, I can separate that into negative A over B X plus C over B. Okay. So that's the equation. So what slope is it that we want? In other words, negative. remember they said the slope is the same. It's negative, negative. A over B, a right? Over B. Yeah. Okay, so M, hold on, M is negative A over B. That's our slope. And the only thing is that this new equation has to go through the origin. Well, how does it go through the origin? What is C over B if it goes through the origin? Uh, zero. Okay, so C over B has to equal zero, meaning what? How does C over B equal zero? Only if C equals zero. If C does not equal zero, then C over B cannot equal zero. In other words, Whenever you have a fraction equals zero, the numerator has to equal zero. Oh. With me? Yeah. So what's my final equation? So it'd be negative a over bx plus zero. Well, we don't need to add the zero. In other words, that's our equation that has the same slope so it's parallel to this line and it goes through the origin 
Now, tell me, well, hold on, rest of it, let's see, I want to erase only parts of it here, it's the only difficult part of this new capability is it's a little harder to erase. Um, what is the, ooh, especially with the large erase, what's the slope of the line perpendicular? Um, y equals b over a x. And this time, I'm going to write the c in there. Hold on a minute. Because this line is not the same. It doesn't go through the origin. It goes through the point 2 comma minus 1. So there's the equation of our original line, right? Yep. Okay, and the only thing we know for sure is that the slope of our new line has a slope of B over A plus C over B. Hmm. All right, we'll write it like that for a moment. Okay, now the fact that it passes through that line 2 comma minus 1. What's that tell me? That x is 2 and y is negative 1. Okay, let's plug that in. Minus 1 equals b over a, which are still unknown constants. Whoops, excuse me. We know what x is. Whenever y is minus 1, x is 2 plus c over b. Hmm. Now we should be able, eh, we still have three variables. Find the equation of the line perpendicular and passes through that point. Let's go back for a second here. Let's see. Our slope is B over A of this new line. In other words, the first line was some line like that. Okay? Okay. Part A was a line that was parallel to that, but went through the origin. Okay, we found that. This one is perpendicular and goes through this point, 2 comma minus 1. So this point is like that. And we need the equation of this line. And the only thing we know is slope. The slope, and let me, let me do this a little different. In other words, we're looking for the equation. Now, I've got that going through the origin, but I don't know that it really does. It doesn't have to. I've approximated where that point is. It just happens to look like it goes through the origin, but I don't know that for sure. So, in this case, I'm going to use point-slope format y minus y sub 1 equals the slope times x minus x sub 1. Do you remember this? Yeah. This is the one you're going to use almost exclusively when you're doing calculus. Turns out that in calculus, you know the derivative, which is the slope, and you know a point. So this is called the point-slope format for a reason, because you know the, a point and you know the slope. 
Well, in our case, we know the slope is B over A, correct? Did I do that? Remember, remember that right? Yeah. Okay. Now, fill in everything else. Y minus what? Negative 1. So that's y plus 1 equals the slope, v over a, times x minus 2. So using point slope gives us that equation, and that's the proper answer. And granted, we don't know what v over a is. But by using point slope, I didn't even have to worry about C. And so you wouldn't subtract a negative or no, a one no, from both this sides? Is actually a very acceptable format for an answer. Notice this format is the same as the point slope format. It's y minus y1, which is the y point equals the slope times the quantity x minus the x. So you don't need to turn that into y equal mx plus b format. Totally unnecessary. In fact, this is a better format. We don't want to turn it into the other. Always remember that, that when you use point slope format, leave it. You don't need to do any simplification. Right, let me see if I can go up on this page. I guess I need to go to a different page, huh? Yeah, let's go to your next email, which I presume is this one. Yep. Are we doing an hour today, Zach? Yeah. Huh? I assumed so, since you always do hours, not half hours so much. Okay. So let's look at this problem. Very appropriate for your where you're living. <laughs> yep. When is the driver 40 miles from Tucson? Um, at 60 minutes. Mm, that's a common mistake that one would make. What's the distance between Phoenix and Tucson? 120 miles. So how far does he have to be from Phoenix to be 40 miles from Tucson? Think about it for a minute. Oh, okay. So, okay. It'd be... miles between the two cities to be 40 miles from Tucson is to be how far from Phoenix? He has to be 80 miles away. Ah, that's that point right there. In other words, the vertical axis is distance from Phoenix. They tried to trick you by giving the distance from Tucson. So, it's at 90 minutes that he would be 80 miles from Phoenix, which would make him 40 miles from Tucson. Okay. What's the speed of the car during the last hour of the trip? Well, let's look at the last hour of the trip is that. And we are looking at a position graph, are we not? In other words, we've got time as the horizontal axis, and we've got distance as the vertical axis. That's a position function. That is an S of T function. Well, what is velocity? Uh... 
Acceleration over... First derivative of position. So when they ask for what's the velocity of t, it's the slope of the s of t. Well, if we look at our s of t, what kind of slope is it for the last hour? That's going to be our velocity. It's constant velocity. And it's all that slope. What is that slope? Rise over run. There's the rise. In other words, this is the rise. This is the run. What's the rise? Uh, it'd be 40. Distance between 120 and 40. What's the rise? Oh, 80. Or, 80, yeah. 80 miles. And what's the run? Uh, 60. Okay, but let's Minutes. call that one hour. So what's okay. the speed? Uh, 80 miles per hour. Exactly. I could have said 80 miles per 60 minutes, but 80 miles per hour is the way to state that rather than four miles per three minutes. That would also work. Notice that if I did say 60 minutes, well, that is four thirds of a mile per minute. That's also a correct speed. That's the same as 80 miles per hour. Just be careful that you know what your units are. The units do matter. Okay. Okay. Write a piecewise function for d of t, the distance from Phoenix, as a function of the number of minutes since the beginning of the trip. Well, we know what distance function or piecewise functions look like. We're going to have one function for that part, and we're going to have another function for that part. So give me a function that represents that line right there. In terms of distance from Phoenix, which is the vertical axis. So how would you write an equation of the part that I have circled? What's the um, always figure out slope first. In other words, you always need slope, no matter what you're doing. That's what calculus is all about is slopes. Y equals 40 over 60. Uh, that's the slope is 40 over 60, or yeah, we'll do 40 miles over 60 minutes, although I could also make that one hour, but I won't in this case. And then X, right? Well, if I want to talk about Y equal MX plus B, and this might be one of the few times I want to use this format. What's B? Where's that, where's that line cross the y-axis? Sorry, that was my roommate. <laughs> he was telling me he was leaving. What, <laughs> what is it? The line that I've circled, where does it cross the okay. y-axis? Um, at zero, right? Okay, that makes B zero. So my equation ends up being Y equal MX plus zero. <coughs> M, just the slope of that line. So my equation equals Y equal two thirds miles per minute. <coughs> or Y equals... 40 miles per hour. Either case, either one of those functions is correct. 
the key is that the B part is zero. Now, let's look at this part. In other words, we know we're going to have a piecewise function. So we've got that piece. We just, I've circled it twice on the lower left. So now let's figure out how to write the function between my other two black marks. What was the slope on that again? Uh, it was 80 over yeah, 60. You know what? Let's leave it in miles per hour and forget this miles per minute. 40 miles per hour is fine for that equation, for the first part of that equation. The second part, the slope was 80 miles per hour. And we can't see where that would cross. But clearly it's a negative number. But we do have points that it's going through. So I don't need, in other words, for me to do a piecewise function, I don't need to work out where it would cross the y-axis. I can write it like this. Pick some point. There's a point. Okay. So we're going to use slope intercept this time. Excuse me. We're going to use point slope. Okay. And this might be confusing a little bit too since I keep jumping back and forth. But when you're trying to write a piecewise function, I find it more easy to use whichever format of a linear equation works best. Well, I don't have a y-intercept on that part. So I'm not going to use the y equal mx plus b because I don't know where the y-intercept is. But I can use point slope. I know the slope and I know this point right here. So y minus what? What is that point right there? Uh, it's 40 or 60. If we're going to work in hours, then that point is 1, 40. Correct? Yep. 60 minutes, but that's one hour. And I've given the answers in hours. Let's stick with hours. So it's y minus 1, excuse me, y minus 40 equals, what is the slope? Uh, 80. Times what? Uh, What's x sub 1? Be What's x sub 1? 2. Or one, oh, okay, 1. That's our point. In other words, I picked, I could have picked any point on that line. Anywhere on that line, I could have picked a point. I chose the lower left part of it right there. And that point is 1, 40. So it's x minus 1. And there is the answer to part. Well, part C has two parts. Let's write it properly. Um, in other words, let's write it in the way they want it written. So let me erase all of this. I'm going to write it over here in the bottom right-hand side. So when, start with my domain, this is going to be, the function is going to be f of x equals when x is greater than zero and less than one hour, the function is this function, which was y equal 40, x. Okay? Okay. I forgot to put the x on there. Pardon me. That first part of that line is y equal 40x with x being in hours. Correct? 
In other words, in yeah. one hour, we went 40 miles. So if I plug in one for X, Y is 40. So the first part of the piecewise function fits that. And the second part, starting on the right, when you ever have piecewise functions, you focus on the domain. In other words, the first part covered from there to there. The next piecewise function is going to cover from there to there. And what was that function? That one right there. If, yeah. you want, if you want to make these consistent, then let's simplify and move the 40 over. So this, okay. this ends up being y equal 80x plus, uh, minus 40, right? In other words, if I simplify that, I get minus 80. Then if I add 40 to both sides, I get that. So that's the second piecewise function, y equal 80x minus 40. And that's when x is greater than 1. Now, in point of fact, the first one is less than or equal to 1, and the second one is greater than or equal to 1. Because this point, the, at the 60-minute point, that's satisfied by both equations. In other words, when x is equal to one hour, I could use this equation to find my position, or I could use this equation. Notice that both of them give you 40 miles as a distance. So this actually applies. You can have it less than or equal to 1 and the other part greater than or equal to 1. You get the same result. Uh, hold on a second. I didn't read this last part here. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to read it best. Let me erase the distance from Phoenix as a function of the number of minutes since the beginning of the trip. So I screwed up. What should I have over here? Um, instead of miles per hour, just be miles per minute. Right. So uh, the first function is going to be two-thirds x. Here, let me write it again. Y is going to be equal to two-thirds x x whenever x is greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to 60. And the function is going to be y equals four thirds x minus um, two-thirds. Because, let's see if that fits. So when x is 60 minutes, this becomes 80. No, this has got to be 40. Oh, because everything's in minutes. So, yeah. In other words, that's 40. And that is true whenever x is greater than or equal to 40. So there is our piecewise function. And you can test any point you want on that graph and make sure that we got it right. Well, let's, let's test this point right here because that point is in both pieces. So plug in 60 for x. Where's y? We're 80 or 40. Plug in 60 for X and for that right there. It's 120 divided by 3, that's 40. Okay. And that's correct. There's 40. And now go down to the second part and plug in 60 for X. What do you get? So it'd be... 
80 minus 40, right? Or Same point. In other words, both of these equations produce a distance of 40 when the time is 60. So that satisfies us. We've tested both points, and both of these equations work for every point on that curve, actually. Okay? Yep. Okay, let's go on. Back up a little bit so I can raise this up. And take a screenshot. Actually, it's noon. You want to stop here? Yeah, we can. Okay. Uh, and I've got this document, the rest of this document, and whatever else you sent. So if you need, uh, when's our next session? We have one for Sunday, but I could also do one on Saturday, too. Should we do it? Yeah, there's a lot of stuff to cover. Yeah, it seems like it. That's what I was thinking, too. What, what time on Saturday? You want the same time, noon? Yeah, we can do that. Is that a good time for you? Yeah. Okay. That's fine for me also. So I'm going to put you down for an hour on Saturday and Sunday. And if we finish all this material before that hour's up, we don't need to go the full hour. In other words, I have no problem with you shortening any of these. Okay based on, you know, we've covered all the material. But this is good stuff. I mean, the whole study guide is 56 questions long. My goodness. So. Where are we at? Oh, we're going to need all three of these hours at least. Yeah. When uh, when are you supposed to be proficient in this study guide? Uh, well, the final is on Monday for me. Okay. So this, this week, huh? Yep. Okay. Okay. Well, I got lots of time open. If you need additional time, we can do it. Okay. As you can see, uh, my Friday, Saturday, and Sunday are pretty open. Um, I might suggest you try a Friday session if you can do it, just in case we realize that we're going to need four sessions. I, that's totally up to you. But um, Whatever you, uh, yeah, I'd have, to, whatever you I'd have to look at my schedule for Friday for that. Okay. Now, this test, is this to determine what your math course is going to be? Yeah, so I'm in 122A right now, and that ends on Mon or no, ends on Wednesday next week. So mm -hmm. we have like you either go into calculus or you go into a course that covers this material, correct? Uh, kind of. Yeah, something like let's that. Hope, let's hope you go into calculus. You definitely yeah. want to save yourself a semester of this material, but only if you know it. As you realized when we did calculus, is that you really have to know your algebra and trig really well. If you don't know algebra and trig well, you're going to have a really hard time with calculus. Now, you did very well with calculus, and I've always been very impressed because I... I you, didn't seem to be on top of the algebra and trig as much as I would have liked to have seen. And that's what they're trying to do now is get you on top of the algebra and trig. And they don't want to take you to calculus until you are. So if you have to take a course that covers this material we're covering now, so be it. It would probably be good for you to retake it. But yeah, you know, but it'd also be bad that my first class in college, I got like a, an E or a D or. Well, exactly. I don't think you would because what would you get in your calculus class at the end of the semester last year? What'd you end up getting? Uh, it was either a B plus or an A minus. So you really shouldn't have any problem with calculus other than you got some weakness in algebra and trick but not enough that it would keep you from getting through it. You managed to get a B plus and an a, or an A minus, and it's not going to be any different. The calculus yeah. you're going to take as the first course is going to be almost identical to the calculus you took as a senior in high school. Uh, yeah, I think I remember a lot of the calc. It's just yeah, the... No, uh, I think you'd be fine. So in terms of getting through college, 
one less course that you have to take, that's better, right? Yeah. Okay. So we want to put every ounce of effort you can muster into getting you past this first test. So you can go straight into calculus and you don't have to take a remedial math course. Yeah, so there's like three three options for the classes I'd be put into. It, it's called uh, 224R, which is like the really rigorous calc class. Okay. Or there's 122B, which is just a calc class, and that's kind of the one I'm shooting for. Okay. And then there's um, you go back and right. you do 122A for the whole the rest of the semester. And trig. That's yeah. what that's going to be. And that's what we're covering now is pre-calc and trig. That's what we'll be covering all week. Okay. Yep. So the middle course is fine. That's the equivalent of AP or that's the equivalent of Calc AB. The top course is going to be the equivalent of AP Calc AB. Yeah. Then you might even be fine taking that. I don't know. That's kind of your call. I'm not sure. Well, I'd hope for at least one of the top two, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and that's what we'll be able to figure. Well, they'll determine that based on how good you do on this test. If you get an A on this test, then I wouldn't be surprised if they put you in the top calc course. But if you get a B or a C on this test, they might put you in that middle one. And if you get a D or an E, They'll put you in the remedial course. Yeah, so for this course, the whole course is 250 points, and 50 points of it is homework, and then uh, 200 points is the final. So I'm doing okay on homework. Okay. It's just the final that okay. it's worth so much. Okay. That, yeah. Well, you know, if it comes down to putting in an extra hour to save a semester having to take a course for a whole semester, that's that's not a bad deal, right? Yeah. So think about that as we go through the end of this week. In other words, if we find ourselves not even close to covering the 53 questions or however many there are, then yep. schedule more time or just accept whatever you get as the result. So, okay. I'll and you actually I'll you have you my know. mom's number in there for my phone number. What's that? You have my mom's number in as my phone number. In there. Yeah, that's okay. I got you my contacts on my phone. So whenever I go to do anything on my phone, I use the proper phone number. Okay. And then how do I pay you? Do you have a PayPal account? Um, I think I do. I haven't used it in a long time. That's the best. Yes. Thing. That's the best way. Okay. Now, what PayPal is, is just an online bank, okay? So you have to fund it. In other words, you have to have an, a balance in there. But if yeah, you have you, enough balance you can, like, there, whatever the balance is, if it's enough to cover my fees, then that's the easiest way to pay me because it's like okay. two, two steps. You go to my website, you put the amount, you click on buy now, you put the amount you want to pay, and then you're going to put in your password for PayPal. Okay? So that's the easiest way. The hard way would be to have to write a check and mail it. Yeah. Do you have Apple Pay? I don't think I have it set up, but yeah, I have it. Well, I don't have it set up yet either. But if you have it and you have funds in your Apple Pay... You might be my guinea pig. In other words, once I can get Apple Pay set up on my website, I may have you try that to pay me, if you prefer that. Okay. It's probably a little easier to use that than PayPal for you. Uh, it's just I haven't set it up yet on my website, so I'm not quite equipped to handle Apple Pay. But I am to, to handle PayPal. Um, okay. So initially, if you, maybe if you can use PayPal, that might work. And as soon as I get Apple Pay set up, I'll tell you, and then you can switch over if you want. All right. Well, I'll let you go. Okay. How cute are the girls? Oh, they're wonderful. I'll bet they are. University of Arizona <laughs> always ranks up there. Yep. Most pretty. Arizona. All, all the pretty girls want to go south. Keep away from the yeah, 
warmer weather. You don't have to go through any snow this winter, you lucky dog. I will. I'll be back up in December. Oh, this. okay. Well, let's hope you don't have to go through it then. <laughs> Pleasant trip. But, all right, Zach. Well, uh, at this point, I will talk to you at noon on September 9th. Before I go, let me just show you something you might not be aware of. If, ooh, hold on, instead of, well, that's weird. Oh, that's because I'm clicking on the wrong thing, sorry. Instead of communicating me, with me by text, the easier thing for you to do is go to Digital Math Tutor. Dot com and if as soon as it comes up okay now go down to where it says schedule a session automatic scheduling book now if I click on that it's gonna okay you want to do an hour online tutoring session pick a date pick a time these are all mountain times and you can schedule something without communicating with me. And it shows you my complete availability. Now, the only problem, and, and I would recommend you doing this unless you want an appointment uh, around noon. Because here's what I typically do is I block off my noon to 2 o'clock periods for lunch. So let's okay. say you wanted an appointment for next Wednesday. It's, it's going to not show me available from noon to 2. Now, that doesn't mean I have to have lunch from noon to 2. If you contact me and say the only time you can fit in a session is at noon, I'll make a session for you at noon, and I'll eat lunch either before or after that. But okay. if it's not around noon, then that's going to be the easiest way for you to schedule sessions is to just go to my website, look at my availability, pick a time, sign in. I get a text message whenever anybody does that. And my, my text message just tells me, you know, Zach scheduled a session at what time on what date. Mm. Sorry, my, my dog's having a seizure. Mm. Well, it's sad to see when a dog has a seizure. It's not fun. But she has, yeah, yeah. Her, toe body, her whole body's locked up. So she's kind of... Yeah, my aunt's dogs used to do that. She's falling around. So my main concern is to make sure she doesn't hurt herself while she's having the seizure. I dread that she'll be at the top of the stairs. I don't want her to have a seizure at the top of those stairs because she'd fall down them and hurt herself bad. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Anyway, that was going on in the background there. So I think I've given you all the information you need, and I'll let you go. Uh, at the moment, I'll talk to you at noon on Saturday. And the only thing I'll do is text you the meeting ID number in advance. Okay. In other words, I don't need to call you and give it to you. Uh, I'll text it to you and then just go to this icon that you see over here it looks like a flower double click that on your desktop put in the meeting id number that i've texted to you and we'll be in a meeting cool okay and you know how to close out a go to meeting click on the x in the upper right hand corner okay talk to you saturday thank you